he presents to you all things legal on Styles FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Good evening, listeners. Can you believe it? It has been one full month since we've got sharing together on this new program, All Things Legal. I am your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Now, each week, we have been looking at a legal issue affecting the Jamaican public. We have also been reviewing some topical legal issues which appear in our news. Now, I wish to remind you that you are free to suggest topics for discussion. You can WhatsApp in your suggestions, your questions, your comments to our numbers, 876 453 one four four four, or if you are overseas, nine five four three three eight seven nine seven three. Now, again, this program is not meant to substitute or replace legal advice from an attorney at law, and you should still consult your attorney at law if you have legal issues, even if the facts are similar to those discussed on the program. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining me for our fourth week, and I look forward to sharing with you today. Now, today is the 28th of February, the last Friday of Black History Month. Can you believe I've been sharing with you for all of Black History Month, and today is the first time that I'll be sharing with you a Black History Month feature. You know, this is a program, All Things Legal, so in this vein, did you know that the three light traffic lights was invented by a black man, Garrett Morgan, in 1923. Now, Mr. Morgan was the first black person to own a car in Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States of America. Now, he witnessed a severe car accident at an intersection in Cleveland, and it prompted him to expand the existing traffic light system at that point in time by adding a yield component warning oncoming drivers of an impending stop. So the next time you get to a three light traffic signal, why don't you thank a black man? Why don't you thank Garrett Morgan? You know, um, we are inventors as black people as well. Another um, invention by a black person, which has some legal permutations um, is the home security system which was co-invented by nurse Mary Van Britton Brown in 1966. Now nurse Brown developed an early security unit for her own home after she spent many nights alone while her husband was away in Queens, New York. Do we have any listeners tuning in from Queens, New York? Now she felt unsafe with the high crime rates in Queens and she found that the police were unreliable and unresponsive maybe because she was a black woman and this security system that she developed it had a camera that could slide into and look through the four peep holes in her front door the camera's view would then appear on a monitor in her home so she could survey any potentially unwanted guest and other features of this system included a microphone to speak to anyone at the door, a button to unlock the door, and a button to call the police. Now, modern home security systems have borrowed various elements from her design. Oh, Richard, you're joining us from Queens, New York. Right. So if you have a home security system at your home in Queens, you can thank a black woman, nurse, Mary Van Britton Brown in 1966 for developing, you know, the home security system, which has features which are common in the home security systems today. You know, Marcus Garvey said, up you mighty race. And even as we conclude the last Friday of Black History Month, I just want to remind our listeners that, um, you know, we are still a powerful force. We have a, to contend with as black people and we have a lot to be proud of. Our numbers are still 876-453-1444 or 954-338-7973. You are tuned in to All Things Legal with Janine Lang, attorney at law. Now on to the first segment of our program, What's in the News? Now, 
On Monday this week, the 24th of February, the Jamaica Observer reported that the Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, is threatening a law to nab parents of misbehaving kids. The Prime Minister was speaking to a group of his supporters in Lucy in Hanover. And he said that there is a great need for the government to introduce legislation um, to nab the parents of wayward children and to have them pay for their children's bad behavior. He said that there is an issue of disruptive behavior among students which led to the establishment of the Parenting Support Commission he developed um, in a previous administration under um, Prime Minister Bruce Golden. And under that commission, they established the deans of discipline across the various schools in the island. I believe even Titchfield High School here in Portland currently has a dean of discipline. I was told recently that students are not allowed to use their cell phones during school hours. And if they are found with a cell phone during school hours, then those cell phones are confiscated and they have to pay a fine to the Dean of Discipline. And then they're allowed to collect the phones at the end of the week. So if your phone is confiscated on a Monday, you're not getting it back until Friday. So Prime Minister Holness said that this system of the Deans of Discipline was instituted you know, during the Bruce Golding um, administration, but he says that the government wants to go further because he said it is unfair to expect the teacher who has to deliver her lesson as the instructional leader of the classroom to divert from her training to go and deal with disruptive kids in the classroom. Right. And he 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 spoke about a particular incident of a school in Portmore where two students were fighting and a father of one of these students came onto the compound and threatened to shoot up the school because he was dissatisfied. Perhaps his son lost the fight. We don't know. But whatever it is, it was totally unjustified and unjustifiable for that father to have, you know, uttered such a, a thing. And um, it is said that the teachers and the students of that particular school are now in fear, you know, in anticipation. And the prime minister said that he has given strong instructions to the commissioner of police to find that father and have him pay for, for that, um, that utterance. So I want to hear from you listeners. Our numbers are 876-453-1444 and 954-338-7973. You are listening to All Things Legal. I want to hear from you. Do you think that we need to have legislation, not just to punish the children who are guilty of these kinds of um, disruptive, violent behaviors in our classrooms and um, in our schools across the island, but for the parents, for the parents also to be penalized for the behavior of their wayward children. You know, there are at least two videos that I saw in the last two weeks um, one came out in the in the um across social media this week of some Wilmerians, Wilmer's boys, who, you know, they verbally undressed the principal of the Wilmer's girls' school in the most vile and offensive way. And you know, I went to Wilmer's girls' school. I spent two years there um, for sixth form. I'm a past student of Titchfield as well as of Wilmer's Girls. And it really hurt me because I really never expected that kind of display from Wilmer's boys who are typically known to be, you know, um, you know, gentlemen. And um, but it is really symptomatic of where our society has descended where our children are really just patterning the behavior that they're seeing of the adults in the society. And um, that was a very disturbing video to witness. There's a further video, I believe it's at Pembroke Hall High School as well in Kingston, where um, a male and female student were involved in an altercation which turned physical. And the teacher was in the midst of that altercation, trying to placate them and to separate them.
I don't know if you saw that video, King, but I'm telling you, that little girl and that little boy, they started sailing some cheers across that classroom like them flinging rock stone. And the teacher of a tech way herself, she literally had to run for color, to, for cover, pardon me. You know, and I, I have to ask myself the question, in those circumstances, do you think it's fair or reasonable to expect our teachers to be teaching under those circumstances in our classrooms? Unless they're getting more pay. But can anything pay you, though, to sacrifice and to put at jeopardy life or limb? Mm? Is that what they signed up for? So, listeners, do you agree that, you know, some parents should be brought to bear um, for, for these kinds of display um, by their children? Should, should teachers be expected to parent your bad behaving children? It is, really, is that really their responsibility, King? Are you sending your children to school for, for the teachers to correct what you are unable or you are unwilling to correct at home? Some of the parents don't know better. Indeed, because even in that case in the school in Portmore, I mean, that father threatened to shoot up, to come and shoot up the school. So he definitely doesn't know better. So that, that propensity for violence that we saw in his son, we can see that it started there. So perhaps in those kinds of cases, it could be justified for a parent to face some kind of negligence charge, you know, for those kinds of display. So listeners, what do you think? Um, you know, um, in view of the large picture, um, you, you know, we have seen several displays of violent activities by our students, you know, um, across, across the island. Um, you know, um, what can and should be done about it? You know, what are your thoughts on the possibility of legislation to penalize parents of bad behaving children? You would think that's a good move. Yeah. Well, King thinks it's a good move. What do you say, listeners? Do you think it's a good move as well? I mean, and of course, it, there, there has to be some balance, you know, because there are also times when your children, they surprise you. You think that you have a saint at home and at school, they are different personalities. You know, I... I had occasion to um, to do a little teaching with some students, and um, we were we were discussing a particular poem, and um, you know, speaking about men and women. And the little boy, he's no more than fourteen years old, and he said, "Woman are wicked, woman are wicked." And I had to really exhort him about it. I said, "You know, where did you get this sentiment?" And it's it's kind of dangerous at your age. What do you know about women being wicked, you know? And to an extent, I believe that he's simply echoing what he's heard said at home. You know, parents, we have to be so careful the kind of things that we speak into the spirits of our children. You know, adult discussions should not be had with children. You know, and um, but when I spoke to him about it, you could see that he felt so ashamed, you know, that it wasn't him. And, you know, sometimes, especially boys, that kind of bravado and to be macho with his peers, he felt like he had to to be to say something, you know, to to look cool or, or whatnot. You know, so there are some cases where parents really are totally in the dark, you know, um, in the dark in relation to what was happening. Oh, I'm seeing a quote here coming in from a listener. It says, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. I love that quote from Frederick Douglass, who was a pioneer um, in the civil rights movement in the United States of America. And I love, I love that you shared that quote, um, listener. Thank you so much for sharing that quote. So we need, you know, sometimes we are so reactive in this country. We wait until, until things get bad. We want to, to deal with these things at the back end in the justice system, but we need to curb the tree from it young. We can't, you can't, you can't bend a fully grown tree. You know, it's when it's, 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 it's young, that's when you, you it's like a broke, yes. So we really want to get it at the, the beginning, you know. Um, so maybe this legislation is, 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 is well needed. But how far do you think that this legislation should go, though, listeners? 
how far should, do you think this legislation should go? You know, there's actually existing legislation, you know, Section 9 of our Child Care and Protection Act penalizes not just parents, but guardians, persons who are who have the custody, care, and control of a child. If that person neglect, neglects or abandons such a child, you know, um, Especially in, in, in some parishes, in, in Kingston, for example, you might see some of these young children and they are of school age. They're at stoplights and they are wiping um, windscreen glasses and collecting money, um, which they're not supposed to be working. The UN Convention on um, the Rights of the Child, they're not supposed to be working at their, their age. You know, um, you ask the question, where are these parents? I remember one time I was at the drive through in Burger King in half a tree and this little boy he was six years old and he's selling chocolates selling a box of chocolates and you know they, they're exposed or society is so dangerous I, i'm so shocked as to how some of these parents are um are so slight you know with the interest and the safety of their children um our numbers once again are eight seven six four five three one four 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 or nine five four Three three eight seven nine seven three. You are listening to All Things Legal on Styles FM. Now, with your host Janine Lang, attorney at law. Now, there's another um, item which made the news that caught my eye this week. Um, it was published in the Gleaner yesterday, and it concerned the those persons who have been guilty of sexual offenses and the child welfare boss, Rosalie um, um, Gage Gray, she was calling for the sex offender registry to be made public. What do you think about that, listeners? We currently have a sex offender registry. Even here in Port Antonio, there's a sex offender registry, but it is not made public. You know, on the 31st of January this year, Trinidad and Tobago, or Caribbean neighbor, they made their sex offender registry public. So this means that if you have suspicions of a neighbor, you don't feel safe with this neighbor, he gives you the creeps, you can go on, if you're living in Trinidad, and I believe even in New York, Richard, if you're still with us, that they, they, the sex offender registry is also public. In a number of first world countries, that's the case. So you can go online, the photographs, the addresses, and the offense for which the person um, was, was, um, was convicted is also made public. It's, so you can know exactly what they were found guilty of. Uh, Mansa Musa, a listener says, put them on display, them nasty man. <laughs> You know, that reminds me of Romaine Virgo um, song, Dutty Man, or Leave the People Pitney Alone, right? Yes, so that's really the growing view of some segments of our society, right? Um, thank you for still listening, Richard. Richard is joining us from Queens, New York. Well, I mean, yes, that's, that's, um, that's actually what the child welfare... Um, you know, um, boss was saying, Miss Miss Gage Gray, um, she was saying that um, it's really a balancing act. It's a question now about the rights of these persons, but then the the rights of these persons have to be weighed against public interest. You know, last week we spoke about emergency powers in a state of emergency. You know, your rights as an individual, it takes a secondary place to the rights of the whole because of the government's need to curtail and to curb the violence in our country. You know, so there are some circumstances where the rights of the whole might trump the right of an individual. And in this particular case, these persons have been convicted. So it's not um, it's not liable. It's not slander. You're not telling any lies on them. You're not defaming their character. They have indeed been found guilty of these respective offenses. And this was brought to the fore because I'm not sure if you guys were following the news, but um, about um, a week or so ago, there was this man in Portmore who um, he was found to have fondled a six-year-old child. 
And when they found out that he did that, of course, you know, there was some mob justice. So the community came on him and I, um, you know, they, um, they attacked him and injured him and he was hospitalized under um, police guard, you know, um, and subsequent to this incident with the six year old, it was disclosed that this was not the first time that this man had done something like this. There were incidents with at least two other persons years apart. So it brings the question, are these people, I mean, some people, of course, they can be rehabilitated, but in the event that they're not rehabilitated, would you want to take the chance that a person like this is living close to you? You have a young child walking home from school on their own, passing a particular um, area, they should get a mental certificate. <laughs> you know, so that's a question. I mean, um, currently, or sex offender registry, because we do have a sex offender registry. I don't want you to forget that, listeners. And it is housed with the Department of Correctional Services in the Ministry of National Security. But it is for their eyes only. So King, and King you and I cannot go and view the names, the addresses, the photographs of these persons, but they are able to do so in Trinidad and Tobago. And their um, legislation in Trinidad, it was, it was premised on the basis that they want to deter, to deter people, you know, from, um, to deter, to punish them, to shame them, you know? You know, maybe if they know that you know, it will keep them in check. You know, um, um, I'm here. Richard is speaking, saying, um, got a phone call. OK, um, before I could finish type, I live in Cambria Heights, Queens. I know Cambria Heights. So far, when you call police, they come. I think the Jews have somewhat to do with it because they have the place where they worship in the cemetery and they're waiting. Bob there to rise. OK. All right. Well, you know, things have changed a lot since 1966 when Nurse Van Britton Brown invented that um, home security system. Um, to an extent, there is certainly a lot more equality um, in the United States of America. You know, in 1960s, the his, the, 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 in terms of um, civil rights, the civil rights movement was was um, was, um, was 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 very very um, prominent. I mean. You know, talk about my guy, Malcolm X, right? That's the general, you know, and Martin Luther King Jr., you know, and all of these persons. But my absolute favorite um, um, civil rights um, practitioner would have to be Malcolm X. And a close second would be our very own um, Marcus Mosiah Garvey, you know, who, you know, but, you know, um, so in the 1960s, America was a very, very different place from what it is now um, in terms of police responsiveness to black issues. You know, leave those black savages to go and kill themselves. So Nurse Van Britton Brown had to take matters in her own hand and develop her own home security system. She was a pioneer of sorts. And to this day, we are still benefiting from her inventive mind. So speaking about the sex offender registry, being uh, made public yes um richard we we know about the underground railroad system with um with um a woman called moses as they refer to her harriet tubman she too was a brilliant a brilliant woman as far as the civil rights of black americans are concerned now um here in Jamaica, there were 2,623 cases of sexual abuse against children in 2019. Can you imagine that? Over 2,600 cases of sexual abuse. And they said that there, this is an increase. This represents an increase of 12% over 2018. So it's increasing. The numbers are rising when they should be decreasing. You know? Um, so the question is... Would you want to know if your neighbor is a registered sex offender, listeners? You're tuned into All Things Legal with Janine Lang, attorney at law. Our numbers are 876-453-1444 and 954-338-7973. Now, would it make you feel safer? What would be the benefit of you knowing? Mm -hmm. 
What would be the, the benefits of you knowing that your neighbor is a sex offender? You know, um, to offer some balance, though, does it penalize the offender twice and deprive him of an opportunity to do better or change? Do you think so? You know, this week, even, um, you know, there was a particular incident in St. Elizabeth where a 25-year-old bus driver was, um, was arrested and charged for raping a 13-year-old girl who he was transporting home from school, 25 years old, a pretty young man. You know, um, if he should be convicted, um, he would become a part of the sex offender registry. And if the government is minded to change the law as it happened in Trinidad and Tobago, then he would be a marked man. He would be known as a rapist for the rest of his life. What do you think about that? Now, I see one of the listeners responding to the first um, news item in relation to whether or not parents should be penalized for the bad behavior of our children. The listener says, I don't agree with it. The environs a child grows is not limited to the home. With the advent of the internet, we have evolved beyond the belief that it takes a community to raise a child. Kids are exposed to what the world has to offer. Poor parenting is in the minor now. The introduction of a legislation is the government's reactive approach to band-aid the evolving mind of these kids. Who will parent the child after the parent has been prosecuted? Well, um, this offers some balance to the discussion. But um, it is true that the internet um, is so invasive now and it's everywhere. But at the end of the day, listeners, you are responsible for the consumption of internet of your child. You know, I believe it was last year I was reading a report where the World Health Organization was saying that children under seven years of age should not have screen time. You know, I also read somewhere that Steve Jobs, who um, was a pioneer um, person in relation to Apple, the iPhone and Mac and all of these um, things, you know, he did not allow his children to own smartphones, right? Um, the, the person who I believe is the CEO of Google, he also doesn't think that children should should be early to, to be should at an early age be exposed to using Google because it depreciates their ability to think independently, right? So, um, right, Google makes you it does make you lazy, and um, you know, back in the day, like I had to go to the library and rifle through encyclopedias and books and do my papers, and you know. I don't think that these children are any brighter than we were. They need to go back to two cups and a string, <laughs> right? So, I mean, I think that there is space for what the um, the prime minister is saying. I mean, certainly, um, if the parent is, and it's not just about prison time because the Child Care and Protection Act actually gives prison time for um, willful neglect and abandonment, you know, up to, let me tell you what the act says. Mm-hmm. If you are found to be guilty of neglecting your child, right, or abandoning your child, then you can actually be liable to a fine or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years. So this is the current, this is the current legislation. So it, it is possible that the, the prime minister is, is talking about um, further um, enforcement of existing legislation or probably adding some teeth to this legislation. But certainly something needs to be done, you know, and we can't expect our government to parent our children. How far do we want our government to be involved in our lives? It's, it's a disgraceful thing to expect the government to have to come inside your home and tell you to raise your children, right? They weren't involved in the making of the children. You know, we need to be more responsible. We need to be more responsible. Um, now, what we're going to be talking about, the main item for discussion this evening, are the proposed regulations for the petroleum industry arising out of that incident in Mandeville at the Fesco gas station. Um, after that incident, Minister of Energy 
um, Favel, Win- um, Favel uh, what's her name, Williams, um, had indicated that more regulations are coming. And we want to talk about some of those regulations which are currently existing, as well as those which, which um, should be enforced, as well as some that we need to see in place to avert and to prevent a repeat of that tragedy which took place before. You know, um, you know, laws are are, are, are are such an interesting thing because laws are really meant to protect us. They're supposed to operate as a fence. And, you know, having watched that video, I, I thought that if some things were done differently, perhaps if there were some safety systems in place, then possibly, you know, that man Daniel Farquharson would not have lost his life. So we want to look at that when we return. So we're going to take a break. Soon come back. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Architects, draftsmen, and surveyors, get your drawings printed in high-quality professional standards. We can satisfy your printing needs. Whether it is for presentation to your clients or for submitting building and subdivision application, make it VJ Printing Services. Whether drawing by hand or with computer-aided softwares, we will plot your negatives and print the copies as you need. We do high-quality white paper printing that is water-resistant and never fades, unlike traditional blueprint. For more information, call VJ Printing at 8 Eight nine three two two six six. The winds they estimated here were 170 miles per hour. Get ready for catch that weekend party vibe. It's Friday Storm with Friday DJ Storm Mookie. With it's not just radio. It's all genres of music. It's dancehall, pop, dancehall. reggae, electronic, hip-hop, Afrobeat, soca, new school, old school, you name it. Every Friday, 5.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. It's a party with DJ Mookie. It's a party. Let's get together. Hardcore Twang Master Swag, the ultimate party animal broke out drink. Made from real Jamaican rum and fruit juice. Flavors available, June plum, sorrel, fruit punch, orange, and pineapple. Swag, like a party animal, best consumed over ice, must be 18 years and older to drink. Drink responsibly. Contact us today at 876-348-6183 for more information. Remember Styles FM on social media. View us on YouTube at Styles FM Radio. Follow us on Instagram at Styles FM. Like us on Twitter at Styles FM 961. Become a fan on Facebook, Styles FM 96.1. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all things legal on Styles FM. Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And we are back. You are still tuned in to all things legal with your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Again, our numbers are... 876-453-1444 and if you are overseas 954-338-7973 Once again, our local number 876-453-1444 and our overseas number 954-338-7973 Thank you for joining us with uh, All Things Legal and Styles FM with your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Now, I had broached the subject matter earlier, the issue of the proposed regulations for the petroleum industry. And I'm already seeing Richard weighing in and saying, you know, they are right in relation to these proposed um, regulations because, you know, elements were there for that kind of emergency. You know, I saw one particular video. And in the video, this is before the, the spark ignited the gasoline. You had two attendants. 
One was standing, another was sitting on a, what appeared to be a mobile phone, and the gas was just gushing. It was just gushing out of the um, the pump, you know. And shortly after that, it ignited. There was some kind of spark, and of course, the explosion happened. And um, quite a number of persons were alarmed, especially because they could have seen um, some of the just a little bit of time leading up to that accident you know you have to ask yourself the question a gas attendant who who works at a gas station did not know that it was not remember you know when you go to the gas station there is a sign which is prominently displayed that you're not supposed to be using your mobile phones while at the pump and this wasn't even just at the pump the gas was just proliferated just just gushing out of the pump and she was comfortably there on her cell phone it it begs the question was she trained was she adequately trained are there safety checks and balances not just at that gas station but at our various gas stations across the island you know um are we doing enough to keep um, ourselves safe and management needs to be tightened. You know, in this particular case, the, the minister, um, um, Fable Williams, said that this particular gas station had passed the safety inspections, which were last done in September of last year. But we don't know if, if in the intervening period they had dropped the ball. We don't know. But certainly I, I, I will anticipate that there, there's a possibility that there might be a lawsuit, certainly from the family of this deceased man. Right? Um you know, Richard says, I, I think they don't get enough money, so they're ignorant somewhat. I mean, of course, you know, there are times when people say that gas station attendants are not, um, you know, um, s sufficiently remunerated. But this, no, is not really a question of the gas station um, attendant. It's really in relation to the manager and the, the owner of the, the, the gas station to ensure that these safety uh, mechanisms are in place to, to secure the safety, not just of the attendants, but the patrons of the gas station. Because gas Gas is a very volatile thing to be working with. Communication. So communication and training. Train is, training is important, Richard. You know, training is important. So, you know, um, they're saying that there is still need for additional safety regulations. Now, some of the existing regulations concerned, as we had mentioned before, the use of mobile phones. Now, I can tell you, I can be very, very um, candid with you in telling you listeners that I have been guilty of that. You know, you know, we're kind of sometimes a little addicted to our cell phones. You know, you get a text message and you're at the pump and you can't wait for come off of the pump. So you're there chatting on WhatsApp or even taking a call while you're getting the gas. And the sign is prominently displayed there, oftentimes in red. Do not use your cell phone. And this might be a wake-up call, not just for myself. Good evening, Charmaine. Thank you for joining us. You know, but not just for myself, but for the Jamaican populace at large, for us to not to take things for granted. Unfortunately, as a people, we're too reactive. We'll wait until things get bad before we start thinking about actions. But we need to get... At the front of these issues, another regulation, Charmaine, that's a good observation that we should turn off our engines. So you should not be getting gas while the engine is still turned on, right? The engine should be turned off. So that's another one, right? The another one is that you're not supposed to be smoking a cigarette. That's very obvious. That's very obvious. I mean, you know, really, you know, you're not supposed to be, 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 be um, smoking a cigarette, right? Um, so, you know, the minister was saying that she's calling um, on Jamaicans to observe the current rules, you know, um, some of these rules to concern um, having naked lights, you know, or um, observing the attendants when they tell you don't park here, especially in circumstances where, where the, um, the gas station is being ref refueled or refilled, you know, a truck is there. We have to be very, very careful you know, again, our numbers are 876-453-1444-954-338-7973. Again, you can join us by WhatsApp in or, um, or calling in your comments, 
you know, your questions, your inquiries at 876-453-1444 or 954-338-7973. I am still your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Now, you know, um, the Gleno editorial yesterday um, further mentioned that perhaps there needs to be an all-island audit there are over there are 320 gas stations across the length and breadth of Jamaica 320 so there needs to be an audit of these various gas stations to see which one of these gas stations are coming up short as far as safety is concerned you know um so there needs to be a review of industrial safety regulations you know Jamaicans you know they said Jamaica is not a real place it's a, it's a thing with them say Jamaica is not a real place because we don't behave like we're not normal. We're not normal in a king. Because, you know, people go to gas station to hang out. We don't understand that gas is something was serious, you know. Do you understand? The gas station is like a spot. The gas station is like a spot, you know. I mean, there are some gas stations where there's even a taxi stand there. People go to the gas station to hang out, to loiter. Majority of gas stations are like taxi stands, and that is forbidden, you know. But sometimes we're just so rebellious as a people. Even in this particular case in Mandeville, people were there on their mobile phones. There were complaints, you know. I heard it's various places across social media and in the news that perhaps if persons had intervened to assist this man when he was obviously in a very terrible state. You know, I could not watch that video because I don't like to take in those kinds of things into my spirit. If I watch something so tragic, I mean, it would stay with me for weeks or months. I couldn't watch the video. People were circulating it. I told my friends, do not send it to me. Right. But perhaps if persons had come to his assistance, you know, maybe to tell him to stop, drop and roll. I don't know. And even after he was in obvious pain, some persons told me. And even after, you know, um, I heard that people were just congregating to take pictures, to take photographs and video of what was taking place instead of assisting this man and his friends had to like stop traffic to take him to the hospital. And I'm saying, Jamaicans, is it that we are more interested in living in the virtual reality than in real life? Does something not happen unless you post it on Facebook or on WhatsApp? Yes, everybody is working for likes, as Chronic says. He's not doing it for the likes. He's doing it for love. What about love, guys? I see another listener saying the, the slogan, Jamaica, no problem is a curse. You know, that's a very philosophical view, but you might be on to something, listener. Another person said, um, I think this is Biggs from Atlanta. He said, what happened to the emergen emergency shut off valve? That's a question that persons were asking as well. But I think, in fact, Mr. Farkison, the person who lost his life, was trying to do that. I understand that he was trying to help, you know, and then... Um, there were also questions, you know, one of the things I think they said the first response is to, um, yes, turn off the emergency, um, the valve, but another response is to use sand. I don't know if you've ever seen, yes, sand, sand has to be at all gas stations. So one of the things that they're saying that they should have done, one of those attendants who was there just leisurely on her phone, who might have been one of the seven persons who were injured as well, because she was in close proximity to the flow. Mm. Perhaps if she had gotten a little activated into action she could have gotten some sand thrown it on what was you know so that could have prevented that 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 flare you know so we're we're just so lackadaisical and so lax and as i said before we're so involved in social media you know um it has dehumanized us it has robbed us of our humanity i you know, the, the, the listeners spoke about Jamaica, no problem. But the truth of the matter is that the old Jamaica, another listen, uh, listener spoke about community parenting, the old Jamaica, the Jamaica that I love and which is dear to my heart is where we really cared about each other. It was more important for us to look out for each other's interests. But no, you're just interested to be the one who breaks the news, you know? 
you want to be the one who passed around that information to say, you know, I got 10,000 shares, a million shares. This is the latest coming out of Jamaica. But a man died. A woman lost her husband and a, a, a daughter lost her father. And it might have been averted if persons, you know, um, were just a little bit more human. They should put him on the next money because he's a hero. Oh, boy, what a tragedy. You know, um, but, you know, you know, again, you know, a number of persons are saying that we need to have the certified standardized training program for petrol station attendance in which safety is a major component. So these uh, regulations needs to be standardized across these 320 gas stations, you know, in, in, in this country. Um, they're also saying that, you know, <clears throat> there needs to be a calibration of equipment, you know, so the Bureau of Standards and the National Compliance and Regulator Authority needs to be doing regular um, checks and inspections. Now, what I found to be so astounding is that the minister also disclosed, no, remember I said earlier that it's 320 gas stations across Jamaica. Now, for 320 gas stations, for something that is so volatile and subject to um, just tragedies and mishaps of this nature that we saw last week, Friday, how many inspectors do you think that the sector has to investigate and to make sure that the regulations are in place and observed by these gas stations? Hazard a guess. How many inspectors, in your mind, for 320 gas stations, for 14 parishes, how many inspectors do you think would be reasonable. You don't think them have none king. How much do you think them have Cassidy? Presently. Yes, presently. <laughs> Ten. Yeah. Oh my. And that is still too little. But guess how many they have? Four. <laughs> four. No, it is physically impossible for four persons to have that kind of oversight responsibility for 320 gas stations. Can you imagine that? Four inspectors for 320 gas stations. Again, it just brings to the fore that we are too reactive. We have to wait until bad things happen too often in this country for us to be taking remedial steps, you know. And I am sure that these are, these are issues that will be brought to the fore in potential lawsuits that we will be hearing about in the coming months. You know, I mean, to, 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 to lose your limb and to lose your life in possibly an unavoidable tragedy is something that somebody will have to pay. So we will, we will, be, we will be looking at that. Again, our numbers are 876-453-1444 or 954-3387973. Three three eight seven nine seven three. You are tuned into all things legal with Janine Lang, attorney at law. Now, there are also issues of zoning. You know, there are issues of zoning and issues of where gas stations should be placed. Now, um, <laughs> you know, the minister, the energy minister, you know, she also made another alarming re um Revelation. She said that not all gas stations are inspected annually. So 12 months can pass and a gas station of those 320 gas stations, no inspector. But of course, I would anticipate that because all four men forget for, for go over 320 gas stations in a one year. Huh? It's not possible. Hmm? So there are only four petroleum safety inspectors. Four. So she says that they're going to be enlisting the assistance of overseas experts as well as building on local expertise, right? Some of the regulations that they want to also bring into play um, and to enforce the issue of um, proper signage, covers on pumps, make sure the right paint is on the top of each pump, and to differentiate the types of fuel on offer, you know, um, and of course, adequate adequate and sustained training for staff or numbers listeners 876-453-1444 or 
338-7973. We welcome your questions, your comments, your inquiries um, as we continue to discuss this together. Now, um, you know, the Jamaica Gasoline Retailers Association, the president of that association is um, a Gregory Chung. And he, he was speaking about some of the things that we were discussing earlier, King. He says that quite a number of our gas stations are used as informal taxi stands, meeting places, general loitering, especially in the town centers where you have congregation and congestion. You know, quite a number of commentators have actually said that that situation in Mandeville could have been worse. If that fire had spread because there were there's a juicy beef patty close by, there's a bank close by, there's so many um, heavily populated business places so close to that gas station, which is smack in the middle of Mandeville, that if that fire had, had spread, you know, I mean, it would have been an absolute disaster. And even in view of that, Jamaicans were close to the scene of the, that incident, wanting to get first-hand footage with their cell phones. That is the curse, listener. That is the curse. Indeed, Richard, I really had to shape my head, you know. Um, and as Big said, you know, um, what about emergency turn off valve, you know, um, you know, and there should also be fire extinguishers on the pumps. The pumps have a shutdown system. We, you asked the question, did FESCO have those mechanisms in place? And if they did, why didn't the workers respond? Why didn't a worker, you know, wow, what happened? What happened? You know, um, the next thing is that in view of a particular incident um, like this, the first step that should have come uh, um, into play is that the attendants should have evacuated or sanitized the area. So anybody who had anything turn all of the, the, the patrons, turn off your engines. Um, I saw, um, I think it was the same Gregory Chung, he was saying that one thing that could be done as well is to put the vehicle in neutral if it's still hot and it can cause an, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 an ignition, a fire or whatnot, then you can put the vehicle in neutral because it's still hot and push it away from the gas station, evacuate the immediate surroundings so that you can, you know, abridge and limit the amount of damage and the injuries that would result from an incident like this, you know? Um, so, so these industrial safety best practices were supposed to come into play, you know, at this, at, in, in, in an incident of this, this case. So, you know, the energy ministry is saying that more laws are needed and the existing laws need to be enforced, you know, as far as, um, the petroleum industry is concerned. No, it's so funny. There needs to be a protocol which is enforced. Yes, Richard, indeed. You know, um, no, <laughs> again, we're not learning as a people because when this incident happened, there's another article that came out in the Observer this week that said that right in the middle of Mandeville at a place called Descartes Road, residents have lodged an objection to a gas station which is being built right in the middle of their community. Mm? Right in the middle of their community. This business, this landowner wants to build a gas station now. Our very first program, yes, Jamaica needs to do better than this, Richard. I agree with you. But in this, in this very first program, remember we had spoken about restrictive covenants and we had spoken about that particular development at Upper Montrose Road in Kingston, where that developer had built um, this two-story, multiple-family dwelling um, townhouse complex, defined the conditional approval of the parish council and the injunction of the Supreme Court of Jamaica, and the court ordered that that building had to be demolished because it had breached the restrictive covenants. Now, this particular area in Mandeville is zoned for residential purposes. Now, remember, we spoke about restrictive covenants. So if an area is zoned for res residential purposes, then you have to make an application to modify this restrictive covenant so that you can have a gas station there. Now, even when you're going to be making an application, you have to notify the surrounding people so that they have notice of it and they can signify their objection or their agreement with it. These people did not agree. They lodge an objection 
and the parish council, the Mandeville Parish Council, they actually said that they're looking to institute proceedings against this developer because they did not get approval, but yet still they are starting to clear the land to make a gas station. You know? And Nepa also objected to a gas station being placed here in Mandeville, right? Because it is not zoned for a gas station. You know, when I looked at Nepa's website in relation to the petroleum industry um, regulations, quite a number of or existing um, gas stations would breach these regulations. But um, the truth of the matter is that in a way, our country has probably kind of outgrown some of, um, you know, its borders, like perhaps, you know, like Port Antonio, for example, 10, 15 years ago, never had so much traffic. So certain issues with the placement of a gas station would not have been effect, in effect 10, 15 years ago. But no, the place is more populated, more people have cars, there's more congestion. So certain safety issues are now brought to bear. You know, um, uh, Mansa says, you know, see the workers on them cell phones. Huh? Um, let me see that comment. You know, see the workers upon them cell phones and gas all over. Man, just sit down like say everything all right. My yard people have to take life more serious. That is true. We're too slight as a people. You know, I mean, I've traveled and I've never, ever. I've been to Europe. I've been to the United States. I've been to other um, Caribbean islands. And I have never when I, when I traveled for sure. I don't see I don't see the gas station being a hangout spot. Jamaicans, I mean, I know we like to hang out, but the, yes, everything ivory, but it's not the place, you know. Our numbers are eight seven six four five three one four 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 and nine five four. Three three eight seven nine seven three. You are listening to Janine Lang on all things legal. Now let's look at some of the regulations. Um, these are the the planning criteria for Nepal for petrol filling um, stations. Now Nepal says that um, that the land should be zoned for commercial or industrial use. It must be designated specifically for that purpose. Right? So those persons who are proposing to build a gas station in Descartes in Mandeville in a residential area, they are way off the mark. Way off the mark. Nepal further says that these stations should be located at a minimum of 500 feet from any public institutions such as schools, churches, public libraries, auditoriums, hospitals, public playgrounds, etc. Now, King, I can tell you that I can identify several gas stations that breach this 500 foot requirement in relation to even a library or a school. Huh? Or a, don't, don't it? There are several gas stations which breach that. You know, it says that the area of land to be developed for the gas station, it should be sufficient to allow a maneuvering of vehicles within its cartilage and should not be less than 12,000 square foot with a minimum frontage of 300 foot on the primary street. So it ne you understand? So it, the, the square footage of the gas station needs to be at least 12,000 square footage. But again, as I said... We have grown up. We, are, we, are gr we have grown up to an extent where we have outgrown some of our planning in various towns in Jamaica. So um, maybe so when some of these gas stations were placed, you know, they were not so close to certain buildings. You know, um, I'm seeing Richard here saying that, um, <laughs> yes, that Jamaica has a lot of problems, including hospitals. You have to wait forever to get a bed. The restrooms are a mess in Jamaica. You need to do better in everything and every way. I wouldn't allow it for them to build a gas station where man live. I'm mad, they're mad. But that's what the people in, in, in the cartet, Mandeville, are saying. They're saying there's no way that they're going to just sit aside. You know, people said that they have made significant investments. They wouldn't have chosen this particular community to build their homes and to raise their families if they knew that down the line, a man would have just buy a piece of land there and build a gas station. The man said, 
uh, one of the, 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 the owners said that one of his children have asthma. Maybe I can't afford to deal with the fumes, you know, and those kinds of things which, um, which would be, you know, per, per, proceeding from a gas station. Another one of the regulations of NEPA is that vehicular access should be reasonably safe with adequate approach distances, especially where main roads and intersections are involved. You know, um, it says wherever possible, stations should be erected on level rather than slope in sight. And this is part of the problem with the gas station it, that is the, the developer who is proposing that gas station in Mandeville because that gas station is now proposed on a slope where it is, it is at a higher level than the homeowner's land. You know, another listener is saying total, total slackness. Let me see that comment, um, Cassidy. Another listener is saying total slackness. You know, it's all about getting a paycheck at the end of the week or fortnight. Very few guests attend on taking pride in their work, and Port Antonio is no different. <laughs> it's one of the listeners. The li we don't know which listener that is, uh, but um, King, you find that to be very amusing, right? So um, it's another one of the... Um, the, 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 the regulation which applies specifically to Mandeville is that the petrol pumps should be located a minimum of 100 feet from any residential building. You know, all service areas should be paved to avoid dust nuisance. You know, um, there are so many regulations. Wastewater from the washing of motor vehicles should be to the satisfaction of health authorities. Fuel should be stored in double-walled container to minimize leakage. You know, um, there are so many guidelines that NEPA uses to determine whether or not they will be granting approval to persons who want to build gas stations. There, there needs to be an impact, an environmental impact study on streams, lakes, ponds, aquifers, which will be taken into consideration. So an em environmental impact assessment will be required from the applicant. Another issue is when it is sited close to shopping centers, stations should be located in an isolated area of the development, right? So there should be a setback. You know, so all of these various regulations are things that we need to start taking seriously, you know, in this country um, as far as petrol stations are concerned. You know, um, we don't want to be martyrs in this country. We don't want to die just to teach somebody a lesson. The laws are in place to protect us and to keep us safe. So I'm urging you listeners, the next time you go to a gas station and you see the no smoking sign, don't argue with your gas attendant. The next time they ask you to come off your mobile phone, just turn it off or, 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 or put it down until you're finished. Um, you know, um, if they ask you to turn off your engine, do that. If they ask you not to park in a particular location, you know, let's just live a little bit more loving and be a little bit more compliant with our laws because indeed it seems that our very lives depend on it. This was a very um, uh, useful discussion. I'm so happy that you joined us for All Things Legal and um, All Things Being Equal. Join us next week for All Things Legal with your host, Janine Lang, attorney at law. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your comments. Until then, next time, bye-bye. Join your host, Janine Lang, on Styles FM this and every Friday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. for all things legal. We'll be looking at everyday matters and their legal implications. All things being equal, stay tuned with Janine Lang as she presents to you all Things Legal on Styles FM, Fridays, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Tax Administration Jamaica presents its annual Special Taxpayers Assistance Program on Tuesday and Wednesday, February 18th and 19th, Tuesday, March 4th, and Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, March 10th, 11th, and 12th. Come in and be assisted with checking and completing your annual returns. 
e-services, TRN, and other tax information. Come prepared by having your records ready. Remember, the deadline for filing your returns is March 15th. Avoid penalties and interest by filing early. Tax Administration Jamaica, working together to serve you even better. Ladies and gentlemen, Changi has turned it up loud in your ears, waking you up out of your bed every Saturday morning with a jump start from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. The jump start with more music continuously all morning long with your host, Changi Styles FM, number one. Zane's Pharmacy is now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. We're here to satisfy all your pharmaceutical needs and more. Currently, we do free blood pressure checks and blood sugar testing, as well as HIV testing and counseling. Zane's Pharmacy, open Mondays to Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and on Sundays for your convenience, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Telephone 876-779-0006. Or WhatsApp your prescriptions to 876-855-6291. That's Zane's Pharmacy, now open at shop number 8, Presa Plaza, Morant Bay. Don't miss the adrenaline rush with the musical ingenious digital team. Saturdays, right here on Styles FM from 4 to 8 p.m. Remember the uprising artists and new music segment from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Also, mix journal hour from 6 to 7 p.m. And the party hour from 7 to 8 p.m. Come, Styles FM. <laughs> Digital T. Our brain. Uh-huh. The epic event returns. Image International Music Festival. Sunday, March 1st. With Style G performing live. Batman all dance pointing. It's all about the first of March. Image International Festival. Style G will be there loud. Hey, just touch 